Hey, Carla, what's the runtime? We have a 90 minutes, but I think we're just getting ready to start going live. So I wanted to give you all that heads up. We're just starting to see folks coming in. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the City of David uh, conversation at the city, the June edition, as we focus on men's health. We are once again uh, excited about our collaboration with Black Health Collaborative and Carla Simmons and her team. And so I welcome one and all thanking you for uh, taking this matter very seriously. Uh, the Bible is clear that our bodies are temples. And so the fact that you are here tonight uh, shows and demonstrates that you are trying to take care of that temple that God might be glorified. And so we pray blessings on over your lives and over all of our participants' lives. We know that the time is of the essence. And so I turn this over to uh, Carla so that she can introduce our panelists and that we might get started with this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much, Pastor, and good evening, everyone. Welcome, and thank you all for having us back. We are always so excited to come and share um, and commune with everyone at City of David Church. Uh, I'm sharing my wrong screen here, hang on. What we wanted to make sure that we do, Pastor, I know you tend to start with a prayer. I didn't know if you wanted to get us started with a prayer to start. Yes, I can do that. Yes, absolutely. Let us pray. Merciful God, we come before you on tonight to give you the glory and the honor and the praise. God, thank you for another opportunity to worship you even in this virtual setting. God, I pray right now that you would just use, God, all of our panelists, pour into their cups they might turn around and pour into our cups. I believe that you will do it. And so I give you glory and praise in advance, God. Thank you for their lives and their commitments and their hearts to serve not only you, but to serve your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all. I know you all are just coming from Bible study, so we know that we will have folks coming in as we move along. So please do not hesitate to join us in the chat, um, ask a question. Uh, we will get started just making sure that everyone knows what kind of our walkthrough is going to look like. So as we've done in times past, we of course are working with the City of David Church. We are the Black Health Collaborative. My name is Carla Simmons and I am the Executive Director for BHC. And we're really excited because I know last time we came to you all, we were speaking to you all on women's health, a very important topic, but just as important, we do recognize, especially in the month of June, we are now talking about men's health. And so how are we doing that and what kinds of things should we expect? So this is just our brief visual, but we wanna make sure that we can give you the general overview of what we're gonna be looking at. And so as I bring greetings, we wanna make sure that you all are aware that we can do a little bit of our tech talk. So everybody make sure that we're staying mute um, unless you have a question, which of course, please feel free to add in the chat. We will, of course, have an opportunity later on to address Q&A. So if there's any questions or anything folks still had um, inquiries about, we definitely want to hold space for that. So, of course, we just had our greetings and welcome and prayer. Um, we'll do a brief highlight of what our survey had left off and where we're going from there. And then we'll introduce you to who's on our team for this evening and what we're going to be talking about. And then, of course, as I mentioned, what kinds of questions you all might have if they are still not answered at the close of our session. So we did, as we mentioned before, we sent out survey, we're almost at a one year mark, can you believe it? So how had we been uh, looking when we first started and what were some concerns that members in the community, members of the church, congregants, board members had? So were we answering those questions and we wanted to make sure we highlighted what some of the feedback was so you all had a chance to review and see where you are expressing concerns and we will send out another uh, survey later on this year just to find out one, have these been touched on? Have they been changed? What are the updates and how can we do better? So a little bit about us, of course, as I mentioned before, um, I'm the executive director and I come with a myriad of folks who are 
members in different aspects. So we are, of course, uh, physicians, first responders, so EMT medics, firefighters, police officers, nurse practitioners and nurses, as well as entertainment and um, brand management specialists. And so we're very excited to collaborate with you as well as other communities so we can strengthen our own. We are partnered and sponsored and backed by the American Heart Association. And one of the goals that we have is what we call our mission in bridging the health literacy gap one community at a time. How we do that is in a few different aspects, which we'll show you in just a second, but developing and enhancing skill sets and knowledge base uh, that is focused on communities of color, more specifically Black and African American communities. One of the ways that we do this is we like to provide resources, information, and community connections, which we're of course seeing here in conversations in this city. We're trying to make sure that we are reducing marginalizations and mortality rates of Black patients in healthcare. So we'd like to try to address pre-hospital uh, challenges that um, affect our communities more distinctly. As I mentioned, some of the ways that we do this, um, we have what we call the three tiered or three bucket areas. And so identifying things like our health education sessions with different topics, example here, some of our skill sets and development, so CPR and first aid with what's called hands-only or bystander CPR, as well as offering some certification classes. And then we, of course, get a little bit deeper when we talk about things like stop the bleed and what is now becoming more and more practiced and what's called FAST, so first aid for se severe trauma. Joining us here this evening, and we want to make sure we truly properly welcome everyone, we thank all of our speakers and all of our panelists for contributing as they continue to do so, because we all know just as your time is so very precious and important, as is theirs. They're doing this out of the goodness and kindness of their hearts, because they want to make sure that we're supporting our communities. So I'm going from left to right. Our first panelist uh, speaker is Dr. Lance Wyatt. Now, this panel of speaker comes near and dear to me because there is a full circle here. Um, Dr. Wyatt comes from a family of academics and family who really digs in when it comes to supporting their communities. And so this is a very important aspect because we here at the Black Health Collaborative were actually awarded um, an award named after his sister, Dr. Lacey Wyatt, a memorial scholarship that supported our organization in putting on programs such as this. Uh, Dr. Wyatt is a physician, a surgeon, a physical trainer, and a mentor, and a proud dad. He holds degrees from Howard University, and Pastor, this I know you will truly appreciate, from David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. His focus is clinical training, and he is, um, that has been with the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center, as well as Harvard Plastic Surgery Residency Program, and biomedical research in both the VA and the National Institute of Health. Dr. Wyatt has certificates from the National Academy of Sports Medicine and the Center for Nutritional Studies in Cornell, at Cornell University in plant-based nutrition. And I wanna hold on to that note just right there. He is also a certified physical trainer with a special, special focus on science and longevity, quality of life through evidence-based interventions. He has been actively involved in the promotion of health and well being for the last 40 years. And he's also very involved at a neighboring church known as Holman, Holman Methodist Church in Los Angeles. We are extremely excited to have Dr. Wyatt. Dr. Loeb, you all may have met, uh, remembered from our previous session because he has, he plays two prong role. One, because he is a certified obstetrician gynecologist, so he was able to come speak to us during our last session during women's health. But the fact that he's also a male and very, very community involved allows him to come over to the other side and speak to us in the male uh, health. Now, I do want to press pause because I know Dr. Loeb has had a, a scheduling challenge, so if he is not able to join us this evening, we love him just the same, but we definitely know he'll be back to support us again. I want to move over to Sergeant to retired, recently, very recently retired, Deshaun Andrews. Uh, Brother Andrews has served on the force of Los Angeles Police Department for 33 plus years. He is a proud husband and father of three very wonderful young men and grandpa to one adorable young lady. 
He is an avid golfer and a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And I do need to pause because Brother Loeb is also a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. He, uh, Brother Andrews also leads a young men's mentoring program group known as the Alpha Esquires, and we're all that much better for it. We thank you and we welcome you, Brother Andrews. Oops. Officer and Sergeant, number two, recently promoted Sergeant Keith Mott, who, oops, I think has just joined us, I hope, I hope. Uh, Brother Mott has served for 23 years with the Los Angeles Police Department. Eight of those years, he has been a federal police officer with the Supreme Court of the United States and 15 um, with the LAPD department. His areas of interest are with the youth groups, both health and mental wellness. Brother Mott is also one of our leads in our bystander. Actually, both Brother Mott and Brother Andrews are some of our leads in our bystander CPR sessions. So if you will not see them tonight during this recording, you will also see them again during some of our um, additional sessions. I do want to pause because if there is anything that I'm missing, you all please feel free to chime in. Uh, correct me if there's any areas, as I know um, in the past you might remember Brother Brody will never let me forget um, the photo that I use. So if there is a photo or if there's anything you wanted to add, please feel free. I do want to go ahead and let everybody know what we're going to be speaking on. So we have a few things that came to our attention from the survey that we just very briefly reviewed. And at, um, after we get started during our discussion, feel free again to uh, ping me in or uh, pastor in the chat. If we cannot get to it immediately in the chat, we will definitely make sure that we circle back. Before we also begin, I want to make sure that those who were interested, we have some folks who expressed interest from the women's dis uh, group discussion that they wanted to make sure that they identified some potential areas or where they could find an OB gynecologist, and a few of our physicians have actually offered um, their information. So we'll make sure that we share that information with you. I want to pause for a moment if there are any questions or any additions. Okay. So hearing none, now, um, Dr. White, I know you're probably going to be the first person that I pick on during this. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I gave you that heads up. But we're going to start talking about things like what would be some of the basic screening tests that we would really want to recommend for not just anyone, but really for our men, because in different stages of life, there might be different things that we need to start getting screened when we go to our um, medical appointments. Can you help us identify some of those areas? Sure, uh, Carla, and uh, let me just say good evening to the City of David uh, community. Uh, it's wonderful to be a participant in a program uh, such as this one. And um, I think, Carla, when um, all patients, male or female, uh, see a physician, uh, it's very important to get a, a what's called a basic metabolic panel. Um, and this is pretty routine. I mean, most of the time when you're seeing a physician on an annual basis for a checkup, they're going to order this. Um, it's also very important to get a study of your lipid or fat profile. And this is going to include tests like triglyceride levels, uh, HDL, LDL levels, and so forth. And it's, this is a very important study. So if high cholesterol, for example, is found, um, your physician can initiate some sort of treatment parameter. Uh, usually when patients go to a physician, they're also going to get their blood count checked. So we're going to get some idea as to whether or not they have elevations or, or uh, abnormalities with their white blood cell count, their hemoglobin, their hematocrit, uh, platelets, which are involved in blood clotting. And these are standard tests. And most of the time, as I mentioned, when patients uh, see a physician, they're going to get these types of tests. Now, of course, there are different types of tests that are going to be more age specific. For example, uh, physicians will start checking for uh, evidence of diabetes or dysregulation in, in blood sugar management. At a certain age, at a certain age, physicians are going to start checking for um, 
biomarkers of prostate health um, and so forth. So, I mean, there are going to be specific things that occur uh, during the course of a person's lifetime that physicians are going to, are, are going to check for. Carla, one thing I, I'd like to impress upon um, the group here is that there are racial disparities, people, in preventative medicine. When you go to see the doctor, some of these studies might not be performed. Um, for whatever reason, patients might be lost to follow up. Um, there are may not have all the opportunities for the best healthcare delivery. So even if abnormalities are found, you may not get the most ideal treatment. And as a result, we unfortunately have poor outcomes as an African American community in general, but especially Black men. In, in most of the things that we're gonna talk about today. So it's important for you as patients to go to your physician armed with information, okay? And a lot of this is incumbent upon you. And guess what? It's never been easier. Most of us, if not everyone has a cell phone and you can look up what are the basic things to check at my age, male, female, et cetera. Perhaps you have a family history in like me and colon cancer. So I'm going to let the physicians know that and have some idea as to what they might be looking for. And I would finally add uh, that one of the things that I'm passionately involved in is longevity, um, slowing down the aging process. And I would, I would share with people that there are things that physicians don't check for that I think we should be checking for. <laughs> uh, there's a whole range of different labs that we can check for that might be good indicators of our longevity or our health span. In other words, living with minimal or no disabilities. So these are things that we're gonna have to take upon ourselves. And um, I, I'm happy to talk about those in more detail, but it's a long answer to your question, Carla, but there are a general set of laboratory parameters that are checked and then there are laboratory specific things as well as tests and studies that are done at different ages. So um, I'll just share with everybody, I'm 56 years old chronologically. I'm scheduled for a colonoscopy because I'm at risk for colon cancer. My sister passed at 45 with colon cancer and I have other family members that also have uh, colon abnormalities. So that's just one thing I need to do. Now, somebody else on this call may have no history of colon issues. And so they may get a colonoscopy once every 10 years, for example, but they may have a strong family history for breast abnormalities. So, you know, a lot of these things that we are asking the physician to do, there are generalized, generalized parameters, and then they're gonna be patient specific parameters based on your individual health parameter and your family history. I definitely appreciate that. And especially knowing those specifics as far as what runs in your family. So it's one, um, I do want to make sure I pause for the cause because you are our, one of our reminders that Black don't crack. Um, we, I don't know that anyone would ever guess that you were 56, but that's a tremendous issue. Yes, I see you all laughing over there, um, but it is true. Um, one of the things we want to make sure that we highlight is we have dropped in the chat the Department of Health Services resource for you all. So if folks want to learn a little bit more as far as where can the public health system help and support, because medical facilities, healthcare checkup, if we don't have insurance, for example, there may be resources available to us that can help offset some of those costs and we can make sure that we see physicians regularly because that is one of the deterrence sometimes is the cost of healthcare. Um, that being said, colon cancer being one of those examples, one that we always tend to see in our communities tends to be hypertension or heart health challenges. And so I wanted to move over into that because be it as young adults, as midlifers, for example, or even those who are becoming seniors, how are we supposed to make sure that we are looking into when should we know to get our, um, our heart checked or what kinds of things should we know about that? So what is, for example, hypertension? Um, and I am going to kick this back to you, Dr. Wyatt, because that's something, for example, that we may not always recognize because it presents differently um, and we may ignore some of those signs and symptoms. 
So how should we go about, should we wait until we're 25? Should we wait until we're 40? Is there, since there's higher degree, because we are um, at greater risk, should we start getting those checks sooner? Um, I'll stop asking questions. And then if anyone has questions, please feel free to uh, drop in them, them in the chat. Sure. Um, well, you know, you, you picked an important way to start, Carla, because heart disease is the number one killer across the United States. And unfortunately, um, Black Americans have higher incidence of heart disease and are more likely to die as a result than our non-white, than our non-Black counterparts. But I just want to take a step back because you said that Black doesn't crack, <laughs> which I appreciate, but let me share this with you. Uh, I'm 56 years old. That just means that the earth has gone around the sun 56 times. My biologic age, I don't know. It could be 60 if I'm sedentary or have poor health or chronic disease. And even though I'm 56, my biologic age, the age of my cells and my tissues could be 46. Some of that's genetic, but most of it is lifestyle. And if we have an unhealthy lifestyle, we're going to lead to cardiac disease. Okay. And that's the number one killer in the Western world in the United States. So you could have really titled this talk, the reduction or the slowing down of the aging process, or how do we extend our lifespan? Because the tools and techniques to do that will decrease your risk for cardiovascular problems. Um, when we get studied, usually when patients go to the hospital or clinic or physician's office, they're going to get their blood pressure checked. But guess what? You can go to CVS or Walgreens and buy, <laughs> you can buy these you know, automatic blood pressure cuffs. They're pretty straightforward to use. And they come with instructions. And because thank you, YouTube, you can you know, YouTube an instruction on how to, how to use them. So if you have a history of high blood pressure in your family, um, by all means, you can never check your blood pressure enough. But if you are seeing your physician on a regular basis, one of the first things they do is check your vital signs. And that includes your blood pressure and your heart rate. So um, now, obviously, if you've got a history of medical problems, cardiac problems, and so forth, there's going to be a different sort of strategy. But um, finally, when we there are four things, people, that have been shown to increase our lifespan, okay? And two of them involve cardiac fitness. So the heart is very, very important. And unfortunately, it's the number one cardiac disease, uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer. And unfortunately, the rates are higher in people of color. I truly appreciate, and I almost don't want you to unmute because you mentioned making sure that we have our blood pressure checked. And I don't think that that could have been more accurate of a statement. Um, but I want to play devil's advocate a little bit. Um, I want to take this one step further because I may not be um, well versed in what normal blood pressure looks like. Um, when they say, you know, oh, yeah, we took your blood pressure, it's normal. Um, is there a range that I should be looking for? What, what's the average number? That means, you know, it's somewhat healthy. Um, and then what's the danger range that we should start looking at what, what, when we get into danger for blood pressure? You know, these parameters uh, change when I was in medical school, uh, a systolic, which is the top number of 140, and a diastolic, which is a bottom number of 90, was considered to be the cutoff between normal blood pressure and high blood pressure or hypertension. Uh, I have seen, you know, that those numbers have slightly decreased to 135 or so, but that's something I would ask your physician when you see them, what the, what the current recommendations are. Obviously, we don't want to have a blood pressure that's too low, but, you know, the subject of our conversation today is, is hypertension. Uh, so um, those would be the general numbers. You'd like to keep a heart rate 
somewhere between 60 and 100. My resting heart rate is 55 as of this morning. And all that means is that I'm utilizing oxygen more efficiently so my heart doesn't have to work as hard. So the better cardiovascular fitness, the better I'm able to utilize oxygen, the slower my heart can work. And that's been associated, strong association with longevity and increasing your health span. I like how that ties in because that really takes me back to what you were mentioning as far as your biological age versus your years around the sun. So if my lifestyle is trying to stay healthy and active and I'm eating properly, I might be 56, but my body is so in tune and it does not necessarily drag to the point where now I have a shorter lifespan potentially. Uh, versus if I'm sitting too long or if I'm too stationary or I'm eating maybe too much fast food or I love cookies, for example. Don't don't shoot the messenger, but I do. Um, but that might be something that I need to work on because it is going to hurt me in the long run. So it's great now, but it'll I'll have to pay for that later. And I appreciate that. Now, I do want to turn. Did we have any questions in regards to heart health or hypertension? Um, I want to pause if there's anyone who need, wanted to unmute and ask a question. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, how, how strongly can I rely on my blood pressure readings to constitute my heart health? And I'm asking because I'm looking at a paper. I just had a physical and I'm looking at my um, blood pressure. and trying to be healthier. Um, to put the numbers out there, I don't have a problem doing it. It's 139 over 64. And the reason I'm asking is because I often get asked, am I taking blood pressure medication? And I'm not. Clearly I'm a heavier person, but I don't take any type of medication for blood pressure. I don't have high blood pressure, never have. So the question being, how strongly can I rely on those numbers and what should I be looking towards? Thank you. Uh, thanks for your question, Constance, and your and your uh, and sharing. We we all appreciate it. When we're when we're trying to clinically assess whether or not a patient has a problem, a disease, heart, or any other organ, we don't just want to look at one indice. We want to look at a, a range of different issues. So just to look at your blood pressure is one thing, but you, you also want to look at other aspects too. Okay, so um, your blood pressure sounds great. Um, and, but one thing we don't, you know, we don't really know is, for example, what's your heart rate variability? Well, we would need a different type of test for that. Um, is your heart beating regularly? Um, that's an EKG. Um, you know, we there's a, there are a lot of questions. So, just to you know, I mean, these are screening parameters. You understand? It's not going to somebody has a heart rate that's normal. That doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have heart issues. Maybe their heart's able to compensate. Um, but we we want to we want to take a look at a range of things. So, yes, that's a normal blood pressure. And that's great. However, I'd need more information to give you more information about your own heart. Okay. Um, I, I can share with you that uh, two indices of longevity are um, number one, your ability to bring oxygen from atmosphere into cells. That's your cardiorespiratory fitness. And number two, um, your body's ability to generate energy with and without oxygen, okay? And both of those can be improved by specific types of training or exercise. Not only will those help you with longevity, but they'll help with energy balance or weight, and, they, and your heart will like it <laughs> in the long term. So 
Uh, again, that's why I said or mentioned, I propose this, the title of this evening's talk would be slowing down the aging process because the tools that we use to do that are also going to help everything we're going to be talking about today, whether it be prostate or diabetes or cardiovascular health or mental health or dementia. Um, all of these are diseases of aging. And by the way, people, guess what? Throughout human history, for thousands upon 50, 60,000 years, the average lifespan was about 19 to 35. Okay? You were lucky if you lived to 40. In the last 150, 200 years, we've more than doubled that. And that's, that's, inc that's an incredible feat in human history. And don't think we're done. <laughs> so some people think that the first person to live to 150 has already been born. And uh, it's up to us as a community to share this information and how we do these things. And this is right now what I do and I do with my clients. Uh, so, but again, a long-winded answer, Constance, to your question about blood pressure. Congratulations, wonderful blood pressure. But again, you know, we need more information. And as physicians, we, we get more information to make an assessment on somebody's cardiac, cardiac health. It's a great question and great uh, stance. Thank you for that transparency, Constance. That was truly appreciated. Um, feel free if you have additional questions, put them in the chat and we will definitely uh, press pause if we need to circle back to it. Um, we had a couple more questions that came in. One was in dealing with cholesterol. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about good cholesterol versus bad cholesterol. And so one of the things that had been inquired about was, what's the difference between good cholesterol and bad cholesterol? And I'm gonna to add to it, say, well, how do I know that it's good cholesterol versus bad cholesterol? Sure, um, we generally speak of your, um, we, if we wanna look at your fats and we wanna look, I'm trying to oversimplify, let me oversimplify this. Your HDL is your happy cholesterol, <laughs> your happy fat. Just remember that because it's at an H, okay? And your LDL is your, boy, who can we think of for L? Um, low vibration. <laughs> low vibration. Thank you, whoever added that. Um, so uh, we basically want to have a nice ratio of HDL to LDL, okay? And that's really key, people. So um, when you get your lipid panel, which you should be getting every year, um, you want to know what your HDL to LDL ratio is over time. You also want to know what your total cholesterol is over time. So you can start making some ideas about trends. OK? Um, last year, I was so fired up. I had really stayed on my lifestyle program, which was a more of a plant-based diet um, and different strategies regards to exercise. And I had the lowest total cholesterol and my best HDL to LDL ratio ever as an adult. That was at 55. This year, it wasn't so good. <laughs> so, and that's despite all the things I'm doing. And I, I talked to my physician, but I said, look, you're getting older. You know, there's some things you're not going to be, it's going to get, it's going to change regardless of what you're doing. But nevertheless, uh, you know, hopefully I've given you guys some information and you can go online and look at HDL and LDL and total cholesterol. So when you get your labs back, you know, and by the way, ask for a copy of your labs. Ask for a copy. So many people say, well, what, how it look good? No, you want to know, you want to be able to follow these things over time, okay? And just getting your blood work done, that's just a snapshot in time and that particular day. So you'd like to be able to say the last three years, my numbers have been this, last five years, last 10 years. You want to start tracking this information. It's very important, obviously. So I hope I've, I've answered who, whoever's question that is about total cholesterol, happy HDL, low vibration, LDL, 
and you want to have a nice HDL to LDL ratio and low and low total cholesterol. Thank you for that. And thank you, Dr. Ireland, for inserting the uh, low uh, vibration. I think that's going to be the new signature. <laughs> um, I see that there is another question. And one was really talking about, um, well, I'll bring this up. Our heart is so important. Um, how do we, uh, should we see a cardiologist for a yearly stress test? Well, if you, you know, you, the way our healthcare delivery system operates is you normally go and see a primary care doctor or maybe an internal medicine doctor. Um, and that's your first line of contact. Now, whether or not they think you need to see a heart specialist, which is a cardiologist, that's their, you know, that's their medical re recommendation. So uh, a cardiac stress test is a, a test that's used to see how the heart responds when it's when you ask it to work. It's done on a treadmill and it gives us specific information. Um, but that's something that usually is is you know is done in your primary care's office. And if they think you need to see a specialist, that's what they're going to recommend. Fair enough. And I wanted to make sure that I did not skip right past something everything that we're all discussing is important. One of the things that was mentioned, I think we need to make sure that we really highlight, and that was asking for your information. Um, and what that lets me know is how we are letting our patients and our community members know how to begin advocating for themselves. Um, no one can really advocate for you more so than you. Learning how to become your own health advocate could not be more important. So I want to make sure we highlight that today because that's one of the things, one of the reasons really that we try to host these sessions is so we know how to make sure if somebody just comes to us and says, oh, your numbers are good, that's not enough. We need to make sure that we're going that extra step and understanding what those numbers are. So we know how to ask the questions and we know how to get the answers that are most important to us. So becoming our own health advocate um, is really key and essential. Uh, I think one of our other questions is, is a cardiac stress test akin to a, I think it's V2, uh, V0, V0 max test. Is that what that is? If I'm incorrect in saying that, um, please correct me. I think it's VO2 max. Is that what the question? Okay, sure. So. Right. No, uh, these are two different tests, uh, everybody. A cardiac stress test is, again, going to look at how the heart responds under pressure, but a VO2 max is a different study. That's going to assess cardiopulmonary heart-lung fitness, okay? And basically, you go into an office, and you get it on a treadmill or a bike, and they put a little mask over your nose and mouth, and they record how much oxygen goes in and then how much comes out. And the difference is how much you used. <laughs> and it's a tough test. I mean, you're, you're, you're cycling as hard as you can or you're running as hard as you can. And out comes your VO2 max. Um, basically, it's how efficiently you move oxygen from air to, to tissues, okay? And there are a number, obviously, of different steps involved in that. Air has got to come in through the airway. It's got to go through the lungs to get to the blood system. Then it's got to go to tissues and it's got to get inside tissues. And once it's done that, it's finished the race. And you know, whoever does that the fastest has got the best VO2 max. So when you see people in the Tour de France, when they're cycling in these high altitude areas or Olympians and so forth, endurance athletes, their VO2 max is excellent. And that again is associated with longevity, okay? Unfortunately, at around the age of 30 to 40, our VO2 max drops about 10% every year. So, we need to start working on things to improve our VO2 max so that we can slow the decline. You can't stop it, but we want to slow that decline, okay? So when you go to the doctor's office and they say, well, you need to exercise and diet, that's a huge hole because they don't tell you what type of exercise, right? You have no clue. So to work on your VO2 max, there's a very specific type of things that you should be doing. 
And physicians like myself aren't trained to know this. So um, at least they weren't when I was in training. Maybe, maybe today there's people are getting a better understanding on this. But uh, at the end of the day, a VO2 max is a, is a very important study and it's associated with longevity. A cardiac stress test is a whole different study. So if we take into a patient to surgery, we want to see, is their heart going to withstand anesthesia? Is it going to withstand the drugs that we're going to give that patient to put them under? That's a cardiac stress test. Yeah, they can tolerate it. But your VO2 max is a little bit different, okay? That's going to be how efficiently you utilize oxygen to run that five-minute mile, five minute mile over and over and over. That's a whole different study. Definitely appreciate that. Um, I, I'm a little depressed as uh, I get older, my lung capacity, um, I see people laughing at me because you might be depressed too, um, that your lung capacity may not be what it used to be. So now I feel like when you get out there and we're walking and we're getting our cardio in, if I'm getting winded, it's not just because I might be out of shape. It's because I'm older. So now I'm a little bit more motivated. That's the way I'm going to take that. And so this is going to kick up my motivation to say I have the younger lungs um, and we're going to get that five minute mile because now I'm jealous. Um, but I definitely appreciate that motivation. Um, if we don't have any more questions about heart health, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, we're going to change over a little bit. Uh, let's talk about blood sugar a little bit. And I know we have two folks um, who have joined us, our two sergeants. Um, who have not just experience with this, but this actually touches them personally. And I know Sergeant Mott is on duty, so if he has to mute, we definitely understand. We also have recently retired Sergeant Andrews, who will be speaking a little bit about their own personal experience and how they are uh, navigating diabetes. Um, so Sergeant Andrews, I see uh, Sergeant Mott is kind of speaking. Sergeant Andrews, did you want to kick us off? Um, and sharing a little bit of insight. Thank you, Sergeant Mudd. I see you coming on. Sergeant Andrews may have stepped away. Okay. Well, if, yeah, since that's why I thought he probably stepped away. So I'll go ahead and, and start. Uh, greetings, everybody. I am Keith Mott, Sergeant with the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, very happy to be here to inform everybody about different things of life changes that we go through and uh, you know how to keep our health up. I am 53, soon to be 54 years old. Uh, been a diabetic since I was 34. Uh, diabetes is one, of, I'm from a family where diabetes runs in a family. Uh, my grandmother had it and her two sons, my dad and both my uncles, they both had it. When my dad was diagnosed, I was a junior in high school. They told myself and my brother, and we were both athletes that, you know, hey, just be aware that as we get older, we could possibly get diabetes. But we were informed on ways to prevent it. Um, and like I said, we were athletes, football players, ran track, bicycle. Um, when I contracted diabetes, it was in 2004, and it was from stress. Now, you know, working out every day and everything, but I was going through a lot of stress. I was going through some personal stuff. Um, not realizing that stress was a good contributing factor to diabetes. You know, we always believe that, okay, if you eat candy, uh, that it caused you diabetes. And, and when my dad was diagnosed, that was one of the strategies that they were uh, teaching at that time was stay away from sugar, you know, no syrupy foods, no candies. When I contracted diabetes in 2004 was when research had showed and talked about carbs. And people like, at that time didn't understand what carbs were. Carbs being, you know, the white starches, potatoes, bread, uh, and vegetables. People are not aware that asparagus and broccoli is considered a carb. It got kind of caught me off guard. Pasta, those those things. And I'm from a southern family that you know, every morning when we had breakfast, potatoes was potatoes and bread were a part of breakfast along with grits. All that starch we were piling on, eating in the morning, and but we would have a good eating, and not realizing that was the cause of. Uh, that is a cause of diabetes. But the way it came upon me, um, I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time. It was during the winter time, and I started having headaches. I started getting chills. So I took it off that I was having the flu. I actually went to the emergency room to get diagnosed for the flu. 
And when the doctor looked at me because of my physical health, because I was working out every day, they took the assumption that, uh, and I, I started getting chest pains. They took the assumption that I had pulled a muscle. They didn't do any blood work. They didn't check anything. So I just took it off that, oh, let me lay off the gym. Well, I stopped working out trying to get rid of these chest pains. And what happened, my blood sugar was started going up. So in March of 2004, uh, my eyesight started changing. I could barely see. I was sleeping approximately uh, 16 hours a day. And it caught my parents off guard because I was a kid that I never liked naps. And my mom saw me one day come home and take a nap. And that was a sign to her something's not right because even in my adult age, you couldn't get me to take a nap. I, I, I used to make the reference, naps were for people who are dead. I'm not dead, I'm not taking a nap. And here I am taking naps. And, and, and it didn't feel like no matter how much I slept, I just felt like I never got enough rest. And then I started losing weight. And everybody associated me losing weight to me working out. And then I started going to the bathroom frequently. I, I could drink a half a cup of water and go to the bathroom and it felt like I drank a gallon of water. And it, you know, not knowing these were the warning signs of diabetes. And finally, my dad talked me into going back to the emergency room. March of two March was March 5th, 2004. I walked back into the emergency room, told him what was going on. When they took my blood sugar level, it registered to the nurse 678. They rushed me to ICU. When they took my A1C, my A1C registered at 14. The emergency room doctor and ICU doctor said people with those levels are usually in a coma or already dead, which explained why I was sleeping so much. But the doctor said the reason I did not go into coma is because of the years of working out, my body was actually fighting it. But me stopping my workout is what caused my blood sugar to take off. Um, I have been off, I'm on medication, I'm on metformin and I take Victoza and I have been off of it twice following, you know, a diet plan, a good eating plan and following workouts. But the reason my diabetes had come back, I put, put back on the medication. Uh, when my dad passed in 2012, I went through grief, which is a form of stress, which put me back on the medication. I came back off in 2014 and my mom passed that same year. Grief is a form of stress, came right back on uh, with stress and then my eating habits are off. So now as I get ready to turn 54, going to 55 next year, the goal is to come back off permanently, which I've been working. I, uh, a year ago, I was up to 230 pounds. As of today, I weigh 205 pounds. And that, that a lot of that has to attribute to changing eating habits. Uh, I try not to go to fast food restaurants. Uh, I try not to get the quick meals out of the grocery store. I actually plan my meals. I actually cook my full meals, um, even with water. You know, I, I, when I make my drinks and I use crystal light sometimes, I try to use distilled water. And I have buddies who've had cancer and they say one of the things the doctors told me about water, you know, regular tap water has certain chemicals in it to kill the bacteria, but some of these chemicals in there are cancer causing and they drink distilled water. Uh, people say bottled water, but you know, there are issues with bottled water when it's been stored in warm places. So I actually have distilled water. I, I bring a lot of water with me to work. And when I'm sitting down behind the desk at work, I try to drink water, try to stay from sodas. Uh, I do drink coffee, but I'm very careful also about what I put in the coffee. You know, when it comes to creamers and sugar, I usually just drink coffee black. It's probably the best way to drink coffee. You don't get all those additives in there. But the struggles of diabetes are real. Uh, you know, especially, you know, in, in the black community, we're so used to eating, you know, good, rich food. But what we don't realize is years of eating good, rich food do catch up with us in some kinds of way. And through research, and they still have not, they still don't know the correlation in male blacks and why is it that if their mother or grandmother has gestational diabetes, why do the males get it, whether we are healthy or not? Uh, and it's usually type two diabetes that forms in, in young black men. And the problem with young black men, sometimes we don't, we don't get our checkups. We don't pay attention to our health. And what's it happening? Diabetes kicks in and we don't get the warning signs, wondering why our feet are numb, wondering why we get numbness in the arms. And it's actually a form of uh, early stages of diabetes that are uh, formed in our bodies. And then sometimes when we find out it's too late, we lose our sight or we start having uh, legs and body parts amputated. 
And another important thing about diabetics, when we get a cut, we don't develop scabs. A lot of people aren't aware of that. Tattoos are very dangerous for diabetics. Um, we shouldn't get tattoos because what happens is when you get tattooed on the skin, you're actually opening your skin and there's no scab to form. So you basically have an open wound and it becomes infected. And once, you know, once infection kind of sets in and you don't address it immediately, uh, that's when you have things like gangrene, uh, different things that happen to your body. But that is a big part of uh, a reason we have a lot of uh, diabetics who have, uh, you know, limbs removed is because once you have that open wound and you don't treat it right and take care of it, it becomes affected. You step on something, you get your, you step on a, on a nail, you don't realize that your foot under the bottom is not healed and it gets infected and that infection sets in your foot. And now you have the amputation process starting in. And once, you know, anybody who's dealt with anybody who's been amputated, has some amputated, once you start amputating, it looks like it's a never ending process. You know, from the toe, the next thing you know, they go to the ankle, now it's up to the knee. Um, and that's the one thing with diabetes, when infection sets in your body, it causes havoc. Uh, I've been blessed to um, only have one infection, which was a staph infection, and it was caught early. Um, and I'm very careful about when I get cuts on my skin. I always keep Neosporin with me. I'm always making sure my hands are washed, areas are clean. I check my feet every day. Uh, I do my own pedicures. You know, I, you know, as a man, you know, to learn how to do a pedicure, well, for my health, I learned how to give myself pedicures. I, I, I have a feet soaker at home. Uh, make sure my socks are always wash, my shoes are always clean. I make sure there are no rocks, anything in it, because these are the these are the preventive ways of keeping diabetes from affecting your body or skin, even down to the lotion that you use or being out in the sun so much. I use sunblock like I use lotion. Because as you can tell, you know, I do have a bald head, but in the same sense, it's open skin. Uh, so I have to be very mindful of, of things like that, being a diabetic. Definitely appreciate that. Thank you so much, Sergeant Mott, for that. Um, that was a lot to share and beyond helpful as far as relatability. Um, I think that is not just beneficial, but can be an eye opener. The one thing that I know I want to segue back to is I know that especially when it comes to wounds, diabetics tend to heal slower. Uh, but not necessarily not heal. So I definitely appreciate that. It might seem like forever and it just may not be happening. Um, I do want to pause for a moment because if anyone, as a reminder, has anything that they wanted to share, ask questions about, we will bring up a couple of things that have to do with diabetes. But uh, Sergeant Andrews, I wanted to make sure that you have a moment to share some of your story. Good evening. Uh, like Matt, you know, he, he covered a lot. So, um, and we actually, uh, like in anything, you need, you need a accountability partner. And so not only is my, uh, my, we are coworkers, um, he's also my fraternity brother. So we, um, keep each other accountable and that's how we both, uh, got off the meds, you know, and I was with him through, um, those two transitions that he talked about. Um, this is probably about as uh, mushy as he ever gonna hear me talk because he know I'm always talking crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's my guy. That's my man, 100 grand. So my story is, is, is similar. Uh, my diabetes was also brought on by stress. Um, at the time my diabetes was brought on, um, when I was diagnosed, I was working, uh, I just finished working homicide. Um, I had just finished concluding working the, I was a lead investigator on the Chris Brown Ariana case. Um, and I was on the officer involved shooting team. And at that time I was a young go-getter. I was 40 years old. Um, when I would go out to these call outs, um, I stayed up, I would have a Pepsi in my back pocket and be down in one. But the thing about it, like Mott said, is that I was in shape. I would still run eight miles a day. You know, I would still go, I, I would still go to the, well, not a day, but I would, when my runs were every other day, every third day, I run eight miles. I was in the gym. So I was in shape. And I was running one day and somebody said, man, what's wrong with you? You didn't wash your clothes. And there was an aroma that was emitting from my body that I didn't 
didn't know what it was. And, and we, we're trained to detect that, but you don't, you don't think it's happening to you. You know, so when this aroma was emitting, I wasn't paying attention. Like, hey, man, I'm having some type of diabetic episode. And so um, how I was diagnosed is uh, I walked into my captain's office on a Friday. Uh, I literally locked on his door. He was in a meeting. And I said, man, something is wrong with me because my legs were burning. I was lethargic, like Mott said. I was going to the bathroom. Like he said, you can drink a, a, a teaspoon of water. And you and your body was trying to flush the sugar out. And I went and had blood work done. And um, I, I knocked on the door. I said, hey, I don't know what's wrong, but I'm not coming back till I figure it out. And, and, I, and, my, and I were working the same division at that time. And so um, I, I went to the, my partner, took me to the doctor. They took my blood. My heart rate was strong. He did all the vitals, the blood pressure, everything seemed normal. Um, he said, all right, man, uh, nothing's wrong. Like my said, you, you may have the flu. So I went home, uh, woke up. I was like, man, no, nah, this ain't, this is not right. It's not me. Cause like he said, I was sleeping a lot. So I called my uncle who's a, uh, who's a physician. And I told him the same signs that I was having, you know, the blurry vision and things like that. And he pricked, he brought, he pricked my finger. And he said, hey, man, it's nothing real big. But he knew what was going on, told my family to take me to the hospital. You know, and alphas always try to run up each other. Hey, Macho, 600 didn't top my eight. <laughs> OK, <laughs> so <laughs> when, I went, when I went and they, and they uh, did my um, test and my sugar levels, it, it, was, it was 800 and it was so high that they had brought in um the, you know there's a chart that they use i was off of that chart the physicians had to come in and do math on how to bring my sugar levels down and they and they would come in all night like my i was in the icu and it was like they were like uh we've never seen anything like this like my they said the only normally people have comas or, or they stroke out and the only thing that they said that kept me alive was that uh, my heart was able to push the surf you know, my heart was strong enough to push to serve. So he covered the, um, so the things that I would say that you should watch out for is, is first the, the sudden blurry vision. You know, I, I was literally watching the Lakers in the playoffs when this happened. And I tapped my cousin on the shoulder and I said, man, can you, is, is something wrong with the TV? And he laughed at me, but my vision was, it was, you know, getting blurry. And so um, the, the urination, your body trying to, to purge yourself with the sugar. Um, you know, you gotta understand that that the blood that's running to your thing through your veins, if it if it's if it feels warm, it's because it's thick. <laughs> you know, these are the symptoms that I had that I, that I was ignoring. And so um, without uh, you know rehashing the things that that Mott said. I was on the metformin for eight years and the doctor was saying, but it was only a small dosage because I had got it. When I first initially started, I was taking six shots a day. And my goal was to get off of the, the insulin. That was my only goal because I figured I had ruined my body and it was, and um, I was just trying to get off the insulin. So then I went from the insulin to the metformin, but the dosage stayed, stayed so low I said, maybe I can beat this thing. So I didn't even tell my doctor, and I don't recommend this. I mean, you know, I'm just telling you what I did. Um, uh, after being on a medication for seven years, um, I said, if it's that low and I'm only taking a small dose, maybe I can take control of my life. So I went to basically a seafood and vegetable diet. You know, I knocked all the carbs out of my diet. Um, I started running. I started hitting the gym. And so when I went in to have my physical six months later, uh, the doctor said, oh, your sugar levels, is, it was 6.1. He said, whatever you're doing, stay on it. He said, the regimen is good. I said, well, doc, I got a confession to make. Uh, I haven't taken that mess in six months. And so from 47, I'll be 54 years. I've been off the meds now for for seven years. But the biggest thing 
Um, whenever I see notice spikes in my sugar, it's when uh, I let the weight get up. You know, so if I get up past 220, 225, I notice the levels go up. As long as I stay below 220, 210, everybody's body is different. You know, uh, whenever I decide I want to, to um, you know, go live a normal life and turn up, I know that there's a price to pay the next week. So um, I know personally that lifestyle, you can definitely control it with your lifestyle um, because it's been working for me this long. Uh, my doctors get worried. I always tell them I'm not going to fight them. I tell them, I said, hey, if, if, if I get to the point where I can no longer control it by uh, with medicate, with, with, with my healthy living style, I'll get back on your medication. But right now, while I'm still healthy, while my knees can still take the pounding, you know, I'm going to park as far as I can away from the front door of, of a restaurant and walk or 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 a uh, or a uh, store wherever I'm going. I don't I park at the last stall and something as simple as going to get some toothpaste, a, a quick speed walk to the uh, <laughs> to the entrance. It's sometimes good enough to get that heart rate up. Uh, I get on that Peloton, you know, th during the pandemic, uh, when the gyms closed, that was a, a scary time for me. I was like, okay, I can't work out. And I wound up getting the Peloton and that's actually what, what kept it, uh, keep the thing in check. So like, like Mott said, uh, carbs, uh, you know, I got tired of, of trying to, um, I got I got tired of uh, trying to wash the plate, so I just you know, like I'm about to eat some some salmon and and <laughs> and, and some mixed vegetables right now, some squash and and uh, and zucchini, and that's gonna be dinner for me. And um, as far as uh, in our in our profession, and I'm quite sure we're all busy. The way I kept and some and in our profession, you know, sometimes you eat what's available, and so. Um, I meal prep, you know, I, I call, I call my guy, he's a chef. He knows what my dietary restrictions are and he, and he prepares me the four meals a day. I mean, a week for me to eat at lunch to, to keep me from in and out. Cause uh, I'm a burger junkie. And if my stomach calls for it, that's why I'm gonna wind up. So at 11 o'clock, you know, and I eat on schedule six, 11 and six. And that, that's how I do it. So uh, that's my story. Uh, watch the stress levels. You know, sometimes you got to tell your boo, I'm not dealing with you right now because you're making my sugar go up. So, uh, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> talking to you anymore. Brother. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Andrews. Thank you, Brother Mott. I see you all laughing behind us. Um, I'm not going to even acknowledge that last part. Don't let your boo get your stress up. But those were tremendous stories to share. And we thank you both for being that transparent and that open. Because, you know, it's my understanding that not everybody wants their business out there, um, especially when, you know, there's points of pride. Um, I want to circle back because I know that there were, you all had not just the chat lighting up, but my phone is lighting up with folks who either had commentary or wanted to address a few things. So I want to gotcha. bring this over to uh, Dr. Wyatt to Can start. With, yes, sir. So as far as sharing your story. You know, because, you know, we're, we're Facebook friends as well. <laughs> and so, you know that I've been very public with the journey. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, every night when I'm in the gym in the morning, I post uh, the legs and show whatever diabetes won't win. And the reason I started doing a lot of people don't know this. But the reason I started to do that when I first posted that I got off, my inbox blew up for people around the country. Like, bro, what did you do? Tell me about it. And so I had to keep going. And when I don't post, people call me, you okay? You're not losing the battle. I said, nah, man, I just took a Facebook break. But um, that's why I did that. And I posted that every morning because I would literally wake up to like 30 or 40 messages. You know, like I said, accountability partner. So I just wanted to put that out there. That's why I'm so open about it because I said, dang, it's people from across the country wanting to know this story and how, how they can kick the meds. So that, nice. I, I just want to, I got that out there. No, thank you for that. I know, Dr. Wyatt, um, I want to jump in with you because I know that you had been waiting to make a couple of comments. And there's a few questions I want to make sure that we can address on the medical side uh, when it comes to diabetes. So uh, did you want to go ahead and share? 
Sure, I just wanted to say um, a pan-Hellenic greetings to uh, the two officers. I'm a Kappa, so uh, we're well, we are well represented. We just need an Omega and some Sigmas to round <laughs> everything out. Um, just so everybody understands, when we eat something, um, the body needs to process that food for energy, and it basically breaks down the components of what we're eating. And that goes through the gastrointestinal or GI tract into the bloodstream. Um, and a lot of that is sugar. So um, the pancreas, which is an organ in our body, secretes different hormones, including something called insulin, which you can think of as a key. It opens a door to your cells to allow sugar to go inside, okay? When we speak of diabetes, there are two types. You're born with an inability to make insulin because your body attacks itself and destroys the insulin making capacity of the pancreas. But these two officers are discussing type two diabetes. And that's when we're making insulin, but our body's not recognizing it. Now, um, both officers mentioned that stress was the tipping point. And when we have stress, and that can be psychological stress, it can be, stress has a whole different ways to manifest, but you're gonna get an elevation in certain hormones like cortisol from the adrenal glands, which impairs insulin's ability to move sugar from bloodstream into cells. So stressful conditions make the insulin that already isn't working work even less, okay? And a lot of people will say, well, obesity, you know, this is why you have diabetes. You know, look, your lifestyle. I, dis I personally disagree. I think that obesity is just another sign of this dysregulated process of energy balance. In other words, your cells are not properly managing sugar and obesity is a body's compensatory response to it. So when I see somebody who's obese and they have type two diabetes, in my opinion, the obesity is just another sign, just like blurry vision, just like some of the other signs that the officers have mentioned that they individually experienced. By the way, gentlemen, both of you are police officers. That's a very stressful occupation. And for the people on the call, recognize that if you're in a stressful job <laughs> like these two, you, that is a potential risk factor, okay, for a diabetic flare. And as they both mentioned, what's true for them is true for everybody. When you're at the job and you're at work, you grab something quickly to eat. And we eat three meals a day, right? That's what we're told. We might have a snack or two. But that's not how we were designed. I mean, if you look at our evolutionary process, we might eat three meals every two weeks. So we live in a food abundant, nine to five sedentary lifestyle, most of us. And these two officers have a very high stress lifestyle on top of that. No wonder why we've got dysregulation in energy balance and this prevalence of type two diabetes, which uh, by the way, um, just like everything else that we're talking about, has a higher incidence in people of color. Uh, we're 60% more likely than whites to have diabetes, two times as likely than whites to die from diabetes, three times as likely to be hospitalized, two times as many amputations, and three times with end-stage renal disease or kidney problems. So, um, you know, this, this is a very important issue. Now, notice people... Both officers said they had a lifestyle change. Both were fitness enthusiasts and they stopped. And with that plus stress, boom, suddenly they're in the ER with a you know, hyperglycemic crisis, okay? Both used lifestyle changes to get off of medication. That's very powerful. And finally, um, when we eat, we're only eating one of three things. 
fats, protein, or carbs. And in defense of carbs, <laughs> in defense, not all carbs are created equal. French fries are carbs. Broccoli is a carb. Okay. A Snickers is a carb. So when we talk about carbs, we need to discriminate. And we want carbs that are going to be nutrient rich but cause as little elevation in the blood sugar as possible. A whole food, plant-based diet does just that. Okay. So when we say carbs, we're going to be very discreet. We're going to say, wait, we don't want high glycemic carbs. Low glycemic carbs are our friends. They're nutrient rich. They're providing our bodies with fuel and so forth. So I just wanted to add that, but uh, thank you both uh, for sharing. That was great. No, and, and Dr. Uh, I, if you can expound on this part too, because I have to explain this to people. A lot of people ask me, you know, do I drink sugar-free drinks? And, and I had to tell them, you know, naturally when I started diabetes, when I found I was diabetic, oh, that was the first thing I started drinking sugar-free drinks. What had happened, I started getting a pain in my stomach. It felt like I had a golf ball sitting in my intestines. I went to the doctor and the first thing he said, without even dying, he says, you're drinking sugar-free drinks. I said, how you know? He said, your body's not designed to digest artificial stuff. He told me, stay away from artificial sweeteners. He was like, look, and he, he broke everything down to me with the artificial. So I don't drink anything artificial. Uh, he's like, that cup of coffee, why don't you just drink it black? You know, uh, if you have something sweet to drink, you know, maybe add a lemon and put a little sweetener. But he's like, the, all these sugar-free drinks, they're not designed to help you because it's artificial stuff in there and you cause more havoc on your body by going artificial. I don't know if you can expound on that to people so they, everybody doesn't think like, oh, let me go do, this, do the uh, sweet and low and, and sugar-free, not realizing that that really is not good for you. Yeah. Well, uh, let me just say this. Um, right now, I'm 24 hours into eating nothing. So the only thing I've had is water and black coffee for 24 hours. I feel great. Now, it's taken me a while to work up to this. And obviously, I'm blessed because I can fast. I don't have to take food with medication and so forth. But what I've done is I've, I'm, I've dropped my blood sugar, <laughs> okay? Okay. And, you know, after around 12 hours, maybe 14 hours or so, my body's ran out of sugar because that's what I've been running off of. And guess what? My body says, it's okay. That's okay. You're out of sugar. We're now going to burn fat. So in these last 24 hours, I'm undergoing a metabolic workout. I call it a metabolic shift. I've gone from sugar metabolism for eight to 10 to 12 hours and now I'm on fat metabolism. I feel great. My brain is clear because that's how we were designed. If we hadn't eaten, you got to be sharp when you see your next prey run by. So I'm very clear. I feel buoyant and light. I haven't weighed myself. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm manipulating my metabolic profile by shifting from sugar to fat storage. And I'm keeping my energy balance in check by reducing my calories. Now, you can drink a sugar-free drink. You're not, it's, it's going to have zero calories, but it's going to become loaded with other things, right? And do you need those other things so it tastes good? I don't, I don't personally. So I'm happy with water. I, I like to drink sparkling water. I make it fun. <laughs> I like getting cherry. I'm going to have a cherry sparkling water. And then in an hour or two, I'm going to have a, a peach sparkling water. You know, it's kind of fun. But um, end of the day, people, if you're drinking sugar drinks, you're just drinking calories. You, you only have a certain number of calories you can burn a day before you start storing it as fat, right? So I'm not saying, you know, I, I'm not a fan of, of artificial sweeteners in drinks. I don't know if it, these cause medical issues, but I do want to share with you guys that when you're drinking your calories away, you're, you're burning up your calories. So make that, if you're going to do that, make that drink a heck of a good one because it's going to come loaded with, with calories and juice, juice falls in that same, in that same rain. Thank you so much for that, all three of you. Um, I love, one, how excited you all are on this topic because it is such a big one. 
Uh, to close out the diabetes uh, conversation portion, um, before I even do that, for the ladies, because I do not want to miss that opportunity. I know this is men's night, uh, but I do want to make sure I acknowledge my sorority sisters of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Dr. Joanne williams Lazoya and Dr. Savannah Kimball, um, to welcome everyone into the D9 conversation portion. Um, but when it comes to diabetes, one of the things that I think we didn't necessarily touch on, um, but we don't have a tremendous amount of time, we keep hearing about people having to get their feet checked. I know we made mention of this kind of briefly, like their hands were going numb, or a lot of times doctors will check your feet. Now, my theory is it's circulation. Um, can you confirm that, or can you speak to that very briefly? Yeah, sure. I mean, diabetes is a problem where there's too much sugar in uh, the blood system, okay? And, you know, when the heart makes that nice pump at the first artery it gets to is a real large <laughs> artery. It's called the aorta. But by the time it gets to your small toe is a real tiny vessel there. And those vessels are very sensitive to elevations in blood sugar. That just damages the blood vessels. So over time, diabetics are going to have problems with their micro or their small blood vessel microvasculature. And of course, it's a small capillary that then leads to tissue. So if, that's, if that capillary tissue junction is blocked, that tissue gets no oxygen. And bacteria and other parasites love an oxygen poor environment. <laughs> so Diabetics are prone to have infections, especially on their feet, because you're walking every day, right? If we were walking on our hands, it'd be the same thing, okay? At the same time, uh, nerves are real large, and then they get real small to go to that small toe. And they're also very susceptible, extremely susceptible to low oxygen. They don't work well either. So you can't feel the wound that's developed because you stepped on a pebble, like somebody said earlier. And you're not constantly looking on the inside of your small toe. And the next thing you know, you've got a wound there and it's not healing because there's no oxygen. You're not getting any nutrients to that wound. And I can't tell you how many toe, foot, leg, below the knee and above the knee amputations, unfortunately, I performed sometime in the same patient. Mm -hmm. It starts off with the toe and they end up with a stump above their knee. Okay. That's tremendously important to mention. I appreciate that. Um, I'm glad you were able to explain that for people who realize maybe um, or just started off with the conversation in diabetes and may not necessarily understand what is happening to them. Um, before we are out of completely out of time, because I know we can all be in this conversation for quite some time if we want it to be. Um, I wanna condense our last two topics into one because this is definitely more male specific, especially this last one. So we wanna talk about things that really affect men in particular, one being the prostate. And so one, I'm a female. I know nothing about a prostate. What is a prostate and why would I need to get this checked? Um, can you at least, you know, can we start off answering some of those basic questions? Uh, a prostate is the male re reproductive organ, so it's it's a man's ovaries, okay? And, um, you know, ovaries house the half of the seeds of life, right? Eggs. So a prostate houses sperm. And, um, you know, there's a very specific um, energy process that sperm need to survive. So... Um, Prostate is a crucial gland for, um, for our species. You need a prostate, you need eggs to have the biologic process happen to get us uh, here today. Um, prostate has been called the most diseased organ in men. Actually, technically it would be skin. Since skin is an organ, there are more skin cancers then there are prostate cancers, but prostate's number two. And it's been said that if you live long enough, 
you will have some form of prostate cancer, okay? Autopsy studies have shown that patients who are um, over 60, 74% of them will have some aspect of invasive cancer in their prostate. And uh, just the numbers for, um, for African-Americans, um, unfortunately, 37% of all cancers in black men, 37% of all cancers, the entire body happen in the prostate. Um, black men have a higher rate of prostate cancer than non-black non counterparts. One in six is diagnosed with cancer, two times more likely to die. Um, when you look at the prostate, you see the largest racial disparities from any cancer. And unfortunately, in black men, prostate cancer is diagnosed at an earlier age. We have faster growing tumors that have a worse type of picture to them or histology. And um, we don't know if that's genetic or not. People are trying to figure that out. So um, black men <laughs> and women, tell your, tell your black men, when you are headed to the doctor's office, you want to make sure that you ask about your prostate, okay? There are biomarkers that we can obtain in the blood system to see if your prostate is secreting too much or too little of something. And of, of course, there's an exam. You get a prostate exam, which is a quite routine. Um, so I can't overemphasize the importance of having a healthy prostate. I can't overemphasize it, obviously. It's something we don't normally think about, but um, it's, it's, you can think of it as the most diseased organ behind skin in men. I, I appreciate that tremendously. And I think there's a two-part question that has now come from this. Um, one, when it comes, well, this might be three, when it comes to your prostate, at what age should men begin screening? Um, because I know we had started off this conversation with screening, the importance of screening. And then I see that we had another question was, is there anything that men can actually do to prevent developing prostate cancer? Um, screening really depends on your, your family history. So if you have relatives that have a history of uh, prostate tumors, cancers, you may want to start getting screening as early as in your 40s. But again, your primary care or internist is going to have up-to-date information on what American recommendations are. It's just important people, everybody on the call should do a family tree with medical issues, okay? <laughs> I can't tell you how important this is to not only know your family tree, but also to know what issues may have been passed down the line that you may be faced with. So 40, 45 have been two ages where people start to get prostate screening. Um, you can ask for prostate screening at any time, but you know we don't want to be chasing something that may be a little bit elevated and actually is nothing. So we use you 40, 45, but you want to check with your, your primary care physician. Prevention is really important. I mean, what do we do for a disease that people say, if you live long enough, you're going to get? Um, but some of the things that I want to share with people is that it has been shown in experimental studies that a milk protein called casein is associated with prostate growth. Now, everybody drinks milk when they're young, right? So, you know, it makes you wonder about this. So um, clearly there may be a dietary component. Um, but a preventative strategy, again, well, I, I like to bring it all the way back to aging and slowing down the aging process, okay? Um, a whole food, nutrient dense, you don't have to go completely, but a plant emphasis diet with uh, different types of physical fitness and so forth uh, have been shown to decrease all cause that's prostate, that's lung, that's brain, that's liver tumors, mortality, okay? And that's the best drug that no doctor can give you. So um, a healthy lifestyle will reduce your risk of all of these medical problems, including 
all cause cancer and including prostate, prostate cancer. Wow. I am beyond excited. And I, I don't know about any of you, but I feel a little bit more reassured with some of the information that we're getting um, because it lets us know that we do have more autonomy over our lives um, and our lifestyles. And there are resources and options available to us. I realize we may not be able to get to every single topic that we had lined up because I know we can bring up more topics for you, but I wanted to press pause because I know we're coming up on the hour. And with that, uh, Pastor Dr. Ireland, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to interject for us for the moment um, while I go ahead and share our post-session survey because we are coming to our close. Before we close, I want to make sure we thank Dr. Lance Wyatt, Sergeant Deshaun Andrews, and Sergeant Keith Mott for participating with us, and not just participating, but truly sharing um, from their experiences, their education, and the resources they have to offer. We definitely appreciate your time. Um, and we thank you, City of David Church, for having us on such a consistent basis. Um, we love connecting and communing with you. Um, and I wanted to go ahead and turn this over, Dr. Ireland and Pastor, if you would. Good, good evening. Just on behalf of, I, and I'm, I'm sure Pastor will jump on too, but I did um, want to say just thank you to the entire panel for sharing your personal experiences, your praise reports, testimonies, the, the science behind a lot of it, um, and just really uh, planting seeds of wisdom, um, this won't be the last one. So even though we did not get to every topic, um, this partnership will continue. And so we can just kind of circle back to some of the things that we missed or some of the things that were really, really important um, that need to be emphasized again. Thank you, Dr. Ireland. Uh, I just wanna say uh, thank you to Dr. Wyatt and Officer Sergeant Mott and Sergeant Andrews for being willing vessels. I want to thank uh, Ms. Carla and Black Health Collaborative for uh, having a heart and a spirit that would want to see uh, people, um, especially our people, uh, live a more health healthier lifestyle. And so I want to thank all of the participants who thought of it um, important in order to come to this table that God provided for us, that our cups might be filled. And so with no further ado, I would like to um, pray us out that we might have the rest of this night for our enjoyment. And so let us pray. Uh, merciful God, we come before you on tonight to give you glory and honor and praise God. Thank you for allowing your spirit to dwell in, on this place, in this place. I'm praising you, God, and I'm giving you glory, God, for the wisdom you told us in scripture, God, to get an understanding. And I believe because of these willing vessels, Dr. Wyatt and Sergeant Mott and Sergeant Andrews and Ms. Carla, we have gained an understanding. And so, God, I pray as an intercessor that you would fill their cups. God, allow for them to leave this call and bless them in every measure, God. Everything that might set their hands to, God, bless abundantly. I'm praying for every life as associated on this call. Bless abundantly, God, with not only the tangible, but the intangible. Allow for us to sleep, God, with joy and peace and strength. Surround us, God, with your love. As men, God, I am lifting up every man on this call right now in the name of Jesus, God. Believe in my faith, God, that not all affliction is unto death. I'm praying right now, asking God that you will remove all anxiety and all apprehension regarding health, that we as men might be the generation that shift the myth that we won't go to the doctor, that we won't ask the prevalent questions, knowing that we, God, are here to serve you and that we are here to serve humanity. And we cannot do that, God, broken down. So give us a breakthrough in this season, God change our mindset, creating us a clean heart and renew a right spirit. We love you, God, and we adore you. We magnify you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and praise God. Amen. Amen.
Thank you. Really quick, Carla, just wanted to, so the, the survey link that was dropped in the chat is um, something yeah, for the participants. She's been talking all the time. To get more oh, feedback. Student charge. Okay. Hey, thank you. 